Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show where we help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. And today we'll talk about how you can measure the success of your hybrid work model. That's what we'll focus on. Now, there's a reason why it's really important to measure hybrid work success. We know that about three quarters of US companies are transitioning to some version of the hybrid work model for at least some of their employees. And these models are going to vary, vary, vary a lot by company culture, by working style. Some people will have a hybrid work model that involves their employees coming in one day a week or two days a week or once a month or three days a week or maybe one day or maybe one week a month full time and then the rest they're not coming in. So you really want to measure. And of course, you have a variety of companies that have a variety of roles coming in at different times. So you really want to measure the success of your hybrid work model because it can be so varied and so diverse and you need to figure out what really works for you. How are you going to optimize it for your company's needs and how will you know it needs to be changed to fit your needs? So the first step is to establish good metrics. Clear success metrics are what you really need to think about to evaluate hybrid work success. And unfortunately, many companies fail to measure effectiveness of their hybrid work models. For example, there was a report put out by Omdia which found that 54% of organizations say that they improved their productivity through hybrid work, but only 22% of organizations established metrics to quantify productivity. Now that's not great. I mean, they're saying they improve productivity, but how do you know they improve productivity? And you, know, you can improve your productivity by 1% or by 10%. Those are big differences. And if you establish metrics, you can figure out how much you improved your productivity, and then you can change something, have an intervention, and see how much that improved further your productivity or worsened your productivity, and then you can go back to whatever change you make. So the point is, if you establish metrics, you can make interventions, you can evaluate things, and then you can make them better. Now, when you're thinking about metrics, you really need to select meaningful ones. You might have heard the phrase that what gets measured gets managed. That's a wise phrase, but you do need to be cautious. You don't want to select metrics that can be gamed. You don't want to select metrics that will be not so relevant for the outcomes you want. So you want meaningful, measurable criteria that are going to be pretty difficult to game, meaning for people to play to the metrics rather than what you're actually trying to measure. If you're trying to measure performance, productivity, and let's say you're measuring by keystrokes, how much someone is typing. That is not a really great measure because are, when they're typing, are they really getting you what you want in terms of productivity, which might be sales or might be programs written or might be our marketing designed or something like that. They can be, it might be much more effective for them to spend less time typing and to have more concise messages and then get the better outcomes as a result. Or they might be better off spending some time thinking as opposed to typing. So you really want to make sure that you're measuring things in a meaningful way. So ideally, you want these metrics to be quantitative and objective, but some things are going to be hard to quantify in an objective way. So those things you'll want to do qualitative and more subjective. Now, whatever metrics you select, you really want to make sure the C-suite is heavily involved in doing so. You want the C-suite to determine the metrics and then the board to approve them. You don't want to simply delegate them to HR because it is a high level strategic decision. In developing your hybrid strategy more broadly, that's a strategic high level decision. So that's why it requires care and attention at the highest levels of an organization. So you want to coordinate and get buy-in agreement on what does it mean to succeed in hybrid work. Otherwise, you'll have a lot of problems later on and disagreements on whether it's successful, how successful it is, what you can change, what you should change for it to be more successful. And that decision-making, strategic decision-making, should happen at an offsite where the leadership team gets together and decides what will work best for their company. So 
the C-suite gets together to determine the metrics, more broad strategy for the company going forward, and as part of determining the hybrid work strategy, determine the metrics used to evaluate it. So you want some distance from those day-to-day -day activities to make long-term strategic choices, which is why I always have my clients who I help transition to hybrid, to flexible hybrid models, have an offsite where they can make these decisions without the day-to-day -day interfering of whatever is going on in their work lives. So prior to offsite, you want to evaluate the initial metrics of what you have to get a baseline of quantitative and objective measures. By And so you'll get those quantitative and objective measures. And these are not going to be the final metrics you use. You'll just get the initial ones, the ones that are reasonably easily available quantitative and objective measures to get a baseline, and then you want to conduct some surveys and focus groups to get a baseline of subjective and qualitative measures. Now, what the, might these success metrics look like? There's a variety. Each may be more or less important. It will depend on the industry that you're in, the company size, your culture, and you want to measure each metric before establishing the hybrid work policy going forward, kind of the long-term, but potentially permanent hybrid work policy, because you want to have that baseline and you want to see how it changes a result, as a result of your hybrid work policy and any interventions you introduce. And then you'll want to evaluate it every quarter, quarter with surveys and focus groups for qualitative and subjective ones, and other tools for more quantitative and objective ones to assess the impact of policy refinements. Now, let's talk about some actual metrics. Retention and recruitment. Retention, of course, is pretty clear to measure. It's obvious, it's quantitative, it's more objective. Recruitment is a softer metrics. It's somewhat harder to measure, it's more qualitative, but you can measure it, of course. So there are some external benchmarks I want to share on retention and recruitment. We clearly see from external benchmarks that offering more remote work facilitates retention and recruitment. There was a survey of 1,000 HR leaders on hybrid work, which showed that 95% believe it's important for recruitment, and I've definitely seen that in my clients, and 60% believe it boosts retention. I think that 60% is reflective of those, some of those who didn't adopt thorough hybrid work, because I've very much seen in all cases where hybrid work is adopted, it boosted retention. So. One thing you can do with measuring recruitment to make it a little bit less soft and a little bit more hard is to evaluate job applicant enthusiasm. There was a report by Owl Labs that found that 52% of workers who were surveyed were willing to take a pay cut for hybrid work options. So what I strongly advise you to do is that if you do choose a flexible policy, you want to display it on the Join Us page of some sort. For example, one of my clients is the USC Information Sciences Institute. USC is the University of Southern California, and they adopted this policy. They evaluated it, tested it, it worked out well. So then they put it on their join us page. And believe me, it has been helpful for them in getting applicants to join them. So the HR will see an uptick in job applicant in inquiries, enthusiasm in interviews. And of course, you'll put this on your of job applications as well as the, the join us page and that enthusiasm can be used as a metric for success so enthusiasm meaning the number of applicants you get for each position without changing anything else so if you have let's say a job site to which you put up applications you can put up one that says what that includes flexible hybrid work policy and one that omits any mention of flexible hybrid work policy for the same position and you can compare the number of candidates that you get. I'll guarantee you that you will get more candidates for the one that talks about a flexible hybrid work schedule. Let's move on to another metric, performance. Performance can be harder or easier to measure. Like I said, keystrokes are not a good measure of it. There are some standardized and objective measures of productivity like writing code. Writing accepted code that's accepted by the quality control, that's a good objective measure. And there was a study published in the National Bureau of Economic Research 
of a company called Trip.com, which is a major travel agency, as you can guess from the name, that launched an experiment. It assigned half of its staff to work full-time in the office and another half to work on a hybrid schedule, about half-time. And it found that the staff who were working on a hybrid schedule were overall quite a bit more productive. Specifically, they can evaluate the programmers, and there was programmers, marketers, HR staff, all of those sorts of folks. Programmers wrote 8% more code over six months. 8% more lines of code, accepted code. So this is a very clear, hard measure of the effectiveness of hybrid work and productivity. Oh, and by the way, the people who were working on a hybrid schedule were 35, had 35% better retention. So talking about the previous metric, which is a huge boost in retention. So not only did, were they, was it better retention, but they were also more productive. Let's talk about more subjective measures of productivity. One effective one is regular weekly assessments from supervisors on how people are doing. Not the tracking lines of code, the not tracking line, not tracking keyboard strokes, that is a bad one. So software tracking programs, I don't recommend it. Again, you're not going to get what you're actually measuring. And also an Owl Labs report found that they cause stress unhappiness in 45% of employees. That is a huge number of employees to stress out. So you really don't want to do that. Moving on, metrics and collaboration and innovation. These are critical collaboration innovation to effective team performance, but it can be hard to measure them. So you want qualitative assessments from team leaders, team members. And so using qualitative assessments like surveys will be quite helpful for you. You can improve those metrics by training people in hybrid innovation and collaboration techniques. So those would be helpful. Let's move on to measuring culture and talent management. Metrics here would include morale, engagement, well-being, happiness, burnout, intent to leave, quite quitting. Why quite quitting? Well, an Owl Labs report found that 46% of employees would quite quit if forced back to office full-time. Not simply resign and leave for another position, but quite quit, meaning disengage from their work. They would just be putting in the minimal amount needed to not get fired, to get by, but they really wouldn't put in 110%, which is really what you want good employees to do, who are active, engaged, look for problems, solve them, that's great. But you don't want them to quite quit. So you here you want to qualitatively measure these culture and talent metrics. So you want customized surveys to measure them. You want to use focus groups as a way of digging deeper into the survey question. So you run a so customized survey, and then you have an opt-in as part of that for a focus groups, which you use to dig deeper into the survey. What about well-being and burnout? There are some hard metrics like employees taking sick days and thought is quite useful hard metric and you can use compare people who are working more remote time and less remote time. And I'll tell you that in my experience, people who work more remotely take less sick days. Qualitative metrics through surveys. You can measure changes over time Look at their well-being and burnout earlier as a, and then as a baseline. And then as a result of an intervention, you can see how that changes people's sense of well-being and then burnout over time. And then you'll use that to evaluate the impact of your policies on employee mental and physical health. Let's talk about DI, diversity, equity, and inclusion metrics. It's an often overlooked but quite important metric to measure. So if to actually evaluate this, look at the retention of underrepresented staff and leaders and use surveys. So you can use retention. That's going to be certainly a hard metrics. Surveys is going to be a softer metric. And here you want to allow staff to self-identify as part of a survey. What we see is that underrepresented groups quite clearly on average prefer to do more remote work than mainstream groups. Moving on to professional and leadership development. We see that companies do struggle to implement effective professional and leadership development in hybrid settings. There was a conference board survey that showed that 58% of employees would leave without adequate development. So it's definitely a retention issue, not, in, not to mention the productivity issue of whether they are going to be professionally improved leadership development in terms of continuity for your company as you get leaders going up the ranks. 
So measure professional development through surveys and focus groups, and then that will tell you how people are feeling about their professional development. And you can assess improvement in areas of development by comparing in-person versus remote learning modalities. See how that works out for you. Let's talk about leadership development and team integration. As I mentioned, it's crucial to the long-term continuity of your company to have effective leadership development. It's, you can have more quantitative and objective measures. This is something that can be done through assessing newly promoted leaders through performance evaluations, 360 degree reviews. So this can be more quantitative and objective. And you can assess the onboarding integration of staff through performance evaluation by supervisors, which is going to be somewhat quantitative and objective rather than self-reports through surveys. And measurements of productivity to the extent that you can make them quantitative and objective, that would be great. So let's talk about the action plan for hybrid work and measuring it. Gather diverse metrics, different metrics, whatever you do, determine are the most important one. So determine what is going to be most critical for your organization. Choose the top three to five metrics and weigh their relative importance. So let's say on a scale of one to 10, how much is each of these metrics of importance to you? You can have one that's 10, another that's eight, another that's seven, and another that's six, and another that's three. So you'll have those three to five top metrics. Use the chosen metrics to decide on a course of action for hybrid work, and then develop a plan of action and appropriate metrics to measure your success. And then you can continuously revise and reassess your policy as needed based on the metrics and how you see things are going. How do you revise your policy in relation to the metrics? You want to revise your policy if you don't achieve the metrics that you desired. That's why you should really run experiments, compare to alternative versions of hybrid policy to the extent that you can have that, let's say in different offices or different business units, you know, different teams. Look at various options and see what works best for various teams and then see if you can adapt that to other teams and see if it works better for those teams. You want to reassess and revise your approach once a month for the first three months and then once a quarter after that. And then you'll want to adopt that approach based on these experiments for a much more long-term, maybe even permanent hybrid work model. All right, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. My name is Dr. Gleb Zaborski. I'm the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, the future of work consultancy that sponsors the Wise Decision Maker Show. Please send me any questions and comments you have on this show at gl uh, my email is gleb, G-L-E-B, at disasteravoidanceexperts.com. Please make sure to subscribe to the show wherever you check this out and leave a review. It helps other folks discover the show and it helps us improve the show. All right, everyone. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. In the meantime, the wisest and most profitable decisions to you, my friends.